Welcome to the latest Economic and Financial Ninja update and this one is THE mega bubble. And the big question is how big is this mega bubble? And that's going to be answered in this presentation. First of all I'd like to give full credit to Bob Prechter from Elliott Wave International because this is one of his uh, recent presentations um, that he did and it's well worth subscribing to because if you want to know about the timings and cycles of markets and even predictions of crypto movements and things like that then uh, Elliott Wave is the place to go. So let's get on with this question how big is it? And you may recall from one of my previous presentations that this is the 100 year Dow Jones index uh, which has been trading broadly between two channels for that period. And the fact is that when we tend to spike above a top channel then it tends to be uh, quite a short period and followed by a much steeper deeper crash back to previous support and resistance levels. So if you go back to the left hand side of the chart you'll see that this is exactly what happened in 1929. And you'll see that we revisited this territory around about the year 2000 when we popped over this line briefly and the fact is that we're over this line again at the moment. Now to put this into context with regards to the year 2000, since the 1970s we've had this decoupling from gold and um, that means that the markets have been subject to heavy manipulation and that means that we've kept above that median average line, the red line, for a long period and you'll see that we bounced off that in the 2006-2007 financial crisis and that was due to epic currency production and the slashing of interest rates. And we've got even more epic currency production now along with virtually zero interest rates in many places. So let's have some context here. This is the S&P 500 index on a normal scale not a logarithmic scale and what you see is something that looks like the crypto market. You'll see that it has gone absolutely parabolic. And you'll also see if you look to the right hand side of the chart quite a steep decline, a very steep decline uh, last year, a brief crash and um, that was one of the biggest crashes in history and it was one of the shortest due to again this uh, pumping in of fantastic amounts of debt currency into the market. But you'll see two steep vertical lines coming in and um, the implication for me is that these lines are getting sharper, steeper and deeper. So we can expect the next one to be even sharper, deeper and steeper still. So here are Bob Prechter's charts. This is a, uh, an index of the stock market prices to GDP, gross domestic product, which is the measure of economy in a country, and sales and earnings and book value. And what we're seeing is the highest equity valuations in history compared to the early 1900s peak. 1929 just before the Great Depression, the 1960s go-go peak, the technology peak in the year 2000 and now what Bob Prechter and other people are calling the everything peak. So here's another chart and this is epic. The valuation of the S&P 500 as shares is over three times one year's sales for each of those companies. And if we compare that to the period of about the year 2000, what we'll see is that that, don't forget, took the uh, NASDAQ 17 years to recover from, 17 years. And now we are way above that. The figure for the Wilshire 5000 index of uh, companies as well, as a percentage of the US GDP, on a quarterly log scale. So again, it's not the normal mathematical scale. This, if we were looking at it mathematically, would be a lot steeper. Is um, the Wilshire 5000 index is double the quarterly US economy GDP. And at the same time, we have record, record margin debt. So margin debt is where people borrow money to buy shares. And we see these peaks happening uh, coinciding with market peaks as well. So uh, the big one 
previously, happened in the year 2000, happened again, 2007, 2008, and we've got the whole thing again, but even bigger now, because this is logarithmic and it's measured in billions. At the same time, we've got record low money market investment. So that's what this top graph represents. And at the bottom, we've got the retail money market ratio as a percentage of the S&P market capitalization. So it's dropped through the floor. We've got all time record lows in cash at mutual funds and the Rydex. That's the top chart. Again, the most important thing is, even if you don't really understand it, compare it to the prior peaks, which were the historic peaks beforehand. We've got the ICI mutual fund cash to asset ratio. So people and funds, mutual funds in this case, not holding cash, but having assets instead. So they've got, they're all in to this market. And then the bottom one is the total Rydex money market assets as a percentage of total Rydex assets in bullish index and sector funds. So bullish means people being positive about the market going up because obviously you buy shares, they go up. But you can also leverage those shares. You can get multiples of those amounts when the market goes up. And equally, you can also buy uh, financial instruments that go up when the market goes down. So this is just showing that we've got another record here. And this bull bear ratio, the people who think that the market is going to go up as opposed to the market going down is again an absolute record. It's completely off the scale compared to the year 2000. And again, this is logarithmic. And then we've got the Rydex total bull to bear ratio. And what we're seeing is, have a look at this chart, the normal range, see what the normal range is. And now we've got something which is 40 times the normal range. And then we've got the leveraged bull to bear ratio, which is the people who are buying shares where if a market goes up by 1%, they'll get 2% or 3% or more. That's called leverage. And you can get leverage shares up and leverage shares down. But what we're seeing is something that is 70 times the market. And again, look back to the years 2000, 2006, 2008. That is more like a normal range. We've got a two decade low in the put to call volume ratio. So calls are the shares that go up when the market goes up. Puts are these shares that go up when the market goes down. So we're at a two decade low in that ratio there. And we've got the eight day CBOE equity share put to call ratio as well, again, at epic levels. And we've got record large buyer call buying at the top chart. And we've got large trader buy to open call purchases. So again, purchasing shares, which are positive positively correlated to when the market goes up. And it's not just the big players who are doing this. We've got record small buyer call buying as well. And if we look at the bottom chart, we have the small traders doing exactly the same thing as well in terms of buy to open trades, small trades of under 10 contracts. We've got record positions in leveraged long ETFs. So ETFs are exchange traded funds. They are a fund that will invest across a market. So they will buy shares in lots of different companies. That's an exchange traded fund. And uh, again, there are leveraged versions. So the leverage means that when the market goes up, you'll get a multiple of that. So this is very, very, very high risk stuff. And these people have made fortunes off this so far. But the problem is when this unwinds, then people get caught short very rapidly. And what happens is then that the people sitting on the other side of the equation do well. And then people scrabble to try and sell what they've got to mitigate their losses 
or even then rush into these short positions to make the market drop even further. So this is the total amount of assets in millions in the largest leveraged long funds focused on the S&P 500, the Nasdaq 100, the Dow Jones and the Russell 2000. Again, just compare for the last 10, 11 years or so. And at the same time, we've got record trading volume in penny stocks. So these are the tiny companies valued in uh, pennies per share. But look at that chart. And we've got record dollar volumes of IPOs, which are initial public offerings. So that's the first time that a company is offered for sale to the market. But the main thing here is just compare it to everything that's gone before. And this is going back to the 1990s. And we have a record number of total IPOs plus secondary offerings per month. So this is the number of IPOs that are happening plus the secondary offerings. Again, just compare it to what's happened beforehand. And bear in mind that those spikes during the 1990s, they were another bull market working up towards the 2000s. We've got a record multiple of money losing to money making. IPOs as well. And again, this is a logarithmic scale. It's working exponentially. And we have a record of US IPOs with negative versus positive net income for the last year. So these are initial public offerings of companies that have negative income. They're actually losing money. They're paying out more than they're getting in. And look at that and again compare it to 2000 and we have a multiple of 12. We have record value for firms earning too little money to pay off their debt interest, just the debt interest. And of course they just roll it over. They borrow more money to pay what they already owe. So when these companies unwind, this is going to be catastrophic. There are these are known as zombie companies. There's the biggest percentage of them ever. They own more money than ever and they're going to be completely wiped out. This is uh, record deals raising capital for no stated purpose. They're just raising money. They're not telling you why they're raising money and they're getting it as well. But look at the graph. Look at how this has gone over the last few years. We've got record valuations for money losing tech companies. So this is how those companies are being valued while they're losing money. And we've got record NASDAQ and S&P 500 volume. And again, just compare it to the dot com mania. That's what it was described as. So what are we into now? I don't know how you describe this compared to a mania of the past. We've got a record percentage of managers taking higher than normal risk levels. These are money managers and uh, they ask them, are you taking higher than normal risk levels? So this is just what they're admitting. And look at that and compare it to everything that's happened before as well. We've got record long exposure amongst the most bearish money managers. So these are the money managers who are the most conservative, who are the most concerned that the market's going down and they have record exposure to the S&P 500 as well. And again, this is a logarithmic scale. We've got record US households equity allocation. So US households owning shares as a percentage of their total financial assets. So you'll see that we were nudging 37, 38% in March 2000 before that epic crash and we're well above that. Foreign investment also tends to coincide with the peaks of markets. So this is what we're seeing uh, back into the year 2000, 2007, 2008, the first two red arrows on the top chart. And here we are at the moment again on a logarithmic scale. And we've got the same applying to foreign investment in US equities. And you can actually search for phrases on Google and things like this. And this is maximum searches for FOMO, fear of missing out. 
And now I'd like you to uh, take a note of the steepness of that decline in the market earlier last year, the so-called COVID crash, and just notice how big that is, much bigger than what happened in uh, 2018 through 2019, and how steep it is and how sharp it is. But that was reversed on the basis of phenomenal quantities of QE juicing the markets, which is creating more debt and making a bigger bubble. So this always happens at a top. These kind of headlines happening, it will never end, it will always continue. The markets will always support, be supported by uh, the Federal Reserve, etc., etc. And these are again signs of a top. And now Wall Street stock analysts echo crypto bulls in seeing nothing but gains ahead. And one of the most bullish firms on Wall Street just hiked its S&P 500 price target. But what is happening to the insiders? These are the directors of the major companies who have to report what they're doing with their share sales and share purchases. And the ratio of them selling so these are the people who know their companies, they know the value of their companies, and we've got eight to one sales happening at the moment. So these people who know the markets and know about their companies are doing exactly the opposite of everyone else, including the financial institutions and the hedge funds. They're getting the hell out of dodge. So how close are we? to this crash? Well, according to the Elliott Wave people, um, we're on wave five of five. That means the last wave. And that supports all of the other evidence that we've seen. So as a quick reminder, this is Elliott Wave. It says that when a market is going up and the trend is up, then we have a one, two, three, four, five sequence. And then a correction within that upward process would be an A, B, C, correction down and then it would resume one two three four five up until the trend changes and when the trend changes then there will be a one two three four five down before there is an ABC correction but each wave can be subdivided into extra waves so each wave the fifth wave in this case, the circles four to five, which is at the top, can be subdivided into another five waves up. And so what the Elliott Wave people are saying is, we look to be in wave five of five. This is a major, major top for the markets. And these people are absolutely brilliant. Bob Prechter is absolutely outstanding um, and uh, I would take what they've got to say very seriously because he's written numerous books and he's forecast all of the crashes that have happened over about the last 20 years or so. And in the meantime let's put this back into context. So here's the S&P 500 index. This is looking like a crypto chart isn't it? This is exponential. This is just what's happened over the last few years. Look at what's happened to this market. First of all, just over the last 10 years. This is completely off the scale. So as a reminder, markets are like pendulums and the more they swing in one direction, the more rapidly and the more deeply they swing in the other direction because they're always swinging around averages. So if this, if this is epic and this is the biggest market bubble since the South Sea Island bubble in about 1720, according to Bob Prechter, then how big is the crash going to be? And as a reminder, in one of my previous videos, I said that uh, Bob Prechter had forecast that the crash would probably begin this year. Don't forget, it's not going to all happen at once. There'll be one, two, three, four, five legs down. So one down, a correction up, another down, a correction up and then a final 
move down. And he's forecasting that it will bottom next year. So that means it's going to be exceptionally quick, exceptionally deep, exceptionally steep. And if it overcorrects, then it's going to be absolutely monumental because the figures that we've seen from his presentation have been completely off the scale in every single direction. So here's a big question for those people who are following the crypto market. How does this impact crypto? And the fact is, we don't know. And it may well all be down as a function of timing. Because in scenario one, when we have stock market crashes, what happens initially is, is especially when people are borrowing money, so using margin to buy uh, shares, uh, especially the, the dealers and the traders, is that they get liquidated and they have to sell everything that they've got in order to keep trading. And so an immediate aftermath of a market crash is that it brings down everything. It brings down gold, it brings down silver, and obviously it will bring down crypto. Now, if that's the case, then we have an estimated bottom next year. And what I would predict then is that being that, as we've covered in previous videos, pretty much the only things in this whole financial and economic system that are not a function of debt are physical gold, physical silver, and most cryptocurrencies, then those things should go off like a rocket. But as Bob Prechter points out, they tend to bottom at the bottom of a stock market crash as well. So there are profound implications in that uh, if the markets also bring down gold, silver and crypto. However, we also need to allow for the fact that it's not a straight line. One down, a correction up, then another move down, etc. And I'd like to consider a second scenario, which is that the popping of the stock market bubble and the bond bubble, etc., coincides with the uptick in the crypto bubble. And that opens up the crypto flight to safety play until the crypto bubble itself bursts. So if the markets start to drop, but Bitcoin and crypto is on its rocket leg, and we now have things like ETFs opening up, then we have the potential for people to much more easily step into crypto through Revolut and through ETFs and things like that. And, um, and that could mean that some of that money runs into the crypto market. And there's going to be an inevitable crypto bubble anyway. We're just waiting for the blow off top at the present time. Now, if it follows the previous cycles, then we would expect typically Bitcoin to peak towards late December and then for the altcoins to peak from that point for about a three week period afterwards. And that happened in 2017, 2018. And it happened earlier this year in May with most of the cryptos as well. So that could be a side effect, which is that some of that money moves into crypto because crypto is still moving up and we get an enormous pump in crypto. It's important to note that crypto is typically not debt related. So in that case, it is like physical gold and silver. But all of these markets are small and the crypto market is so early, so small and so speculative that it is more prone to very big speculative cycles. So bubbles with blow off tops. And bear in mind, we're talking about a bond market bubble, which is bigger than the stock market and a stock market bubble. They all go into bubbles. But what that means is the smaller the market, the, the earlier it is, the more speculative it is, then the more likely it is to go vertical and to drop precipitously off the other end. So we're just going to have to watch and see in this situation as to what happens. But I referred to a previous video by Bob Prechter in which he talked about the Elliott Wave theory being that uh, the market drop starts this year and it bottoms next year and the disparity between Elliott waves and cycles uh, for measuring uh, where the bottom of the market would be. And uh, clearly at the moment we have not started at present the drop in the stock markets, etc. Uh, but he was forecasting the bottom for next year. We have to wait and see because my interpretation of this information is that it depends on 
timing. And if crypto is still rocketing up, then um, it could be undermined by a stock market crash. So what would happen in that scenario? So what we're seeing in this chart is a logarithmic chart of the price of Bitcoin. It's the only way that it makes any sort of sense because Bitcoin has gone up from such tiny amounts to such huge amounts that you lose sight of this relationship. So what we see here is that on a logarithmic scale, Bitcoin has also been trading within a channel. The implication of that is that if money absolutely starts to flood into Bitcoin, then we could burst above that channel, which is quite possible. And it tends to happen in a spiky manner for a brief period of time. And when it does, that tends to be a key reversal indicator, indicating that the market will first of all correct to the norm and then crash below steeply, deeply and quickly. So there are some indicators to give us some information about where we are in this market. And where we are is really quite equivalent to where we were in November 2017 at the present time. And that means that we could have a very rapid bubble. The big question is when do we keep following this December peak for Bitcoin or does that get extended? But bear this in mind, if Bitcoin does not get its blow off top, then I would expect something similar to what happened in May this year, which is that it trends down within this channel for a period of time. And what that means is that it's just delaying the inevitable blow off top. And the longer it's delayed, the higher the blow off top is going to be because these channels are trending upwards until the trend changes. And because the channel is trending ever upwards, it means the longer we go, the higher the potential top for Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies. So this is just something to be aware of. What happens to Bitcoin and crypto if there is a major market crash? It will either be brought right the way down with everything else until the bottom of the stock market, or it may possibly buck the trend if crypto is having its acceleration phase at the same time as the stock market comes down and some of the big money decides, well, if I'm going to lose a lot of money on the stock market and I know we're in a bubble and lots of people now know we're in a bubble, I might as well be exposed to something which has greater upside. So there could be the potential for that kind of reaction of people just flocking like sheep into Bitcoin and crypto at exactly the wrong time for them because people think oh, everyone knows this. Everyone knows that Bitcoin has its cycles and its bubbles and stuff like that. And it's not true. Where is the money going into, into uh, the crypto market at the moment? It's coming from two main areas. One is coming from the smart money, the banks, the hedge funds, etc., etc. But the other one is the flow of uh, retail investors, young people especially, into things like meme coins. You know, if they were serious about crypto, they'd probably be going into um, Solana and Ethereum and Bitcoin and uh, a whole load of other coins, VeChain and things like that. But they're not. Um, and the result is that the meme coins are the ones that have been absolutely exploding so far. And that's just a sign of the bubble to come. So um, do those people know about the crypto cycles and the crypto tops and things like that? We've got normal people coming into this market now. We've got people who haven't been able to um, get work their way around crypto wallets and crypto exchanges and stuff like that. ETFs and things are a wide open opportunity for them to just phone a broker and say, sell this and buy Bitcoin. And the fact is that this market is still prone to bubbles. So making assumptions about what other people know and what people think is not true. 
we've got a whole load of brand new people coming into this market and the upside is absolutely enormous. Bear in mind what Raoul Pal said recently, which is that this market is growing at more than twice the speed of the internet at the moment, that is over 100% a year, and that's exponential. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32, 64, 128, etc. So we're looking at a market that is gonna grow into a $100 trillion market from where it is at the moment within the next 10 years. And on that basis, a lot of the people getting in won't have a clue about crypto and about Bitcoin and things like that. And ultimately the function of a blow off top is where people are buying and holding. Therefore, there is reduced supply on the market and the floodgates are opening for new buyers to come in and they're having to pay on the margin more and more and more for what they're buying. And that sends the price up and up and up into a vertical needle-like spike. And until the buyers, the new buyers are exhausted and then people are probably selling into that market all the time, but someone or some people or a group of whales or whatever go, well, that's fantastic. I made an absolute fortune. I'm just gonna get my money out or I'm gonna sell everything or something like that. And then you suddenly have a greatly increased supply on an exhausted group of buyers. And that then means that you have an equally needle-like drop on the other side. And that's exactly what happens with uh, crypto. So we just need to bear that in mind. Um, people will be buying into that market still. Uh, they will not be aware of the cycle. They will not be aware of um, the crypto blow off top. They'll be sucked in by Bitcoin 100,000. Bitcoin may be a lot more than that, even over the, over the next few weeks. And they will want some of that. And they'll have sat on their hands for so long and they'll suddenly decide, oh, I've got to get some of this at exactly the wrong time because that is how markets work. So us knowing about bubbles and the crypto market and things like that becomes very important. So don't make assumptions about what other people know or they don't know. We have to be pretty measured and realistic about this in terms of understanding that some people know they don't know. They haven't asked. They don't know where to research, etc. So forewarned is forearmed. Um, we're now, I think, in the very close to the blow-off top phase of the market. There will be more videos to come. So thank you very much for watching. And full credit to Bob Prechter for his work. Uh, as I said, if you're interested in timing markets and the cycles of markets and their flows, etc., then the Elliott Wave subscription is well worthwhile. Thank you for watching.